This is the River Trent in Gainsborough, Lincolnshire in England. It's hard to imagine that in 1608 this river would have been teeming with boats going up and down the river between the North Sea and the Midlands of England. If we'd been here in May 1608 we would have seen a motley bunch of women, children and a few old men getting into a small boat called the Francis to make their own journey down this river out to the North Sea with the intention of going to the Netherlands. Who were these people? Well, they were made up of members of two local separatist congregations. A few of them were from the Scrooby congregation, led by Richard Clifton and William Brewster. And a few others were from the congregation here in Gainsborough, led by John Smith and Thomas Helwys, who actually paid for the boat. How was it that after 60 years or so of the English Reformation that people felt that they needed to leave the country to have freedom? That's what we're going to investigate and we're going to find out how the Gainsborough congregation, members of that group, came back to England to set up the English Baptists and also brought with them a great story of religious freedom for all people. We've walked a few steps from the River Trent over to the Gainsborough Old Hall. This magnificent building reflects the commercial importance of Gainsborough as one of England's premier river ports in the 1500s. Uh, for a long time it belonged to the de Burr family and they had uh, a visit from Henry VIII who came to stay here but interestingly uh, one of the wives of the sons was Catherine Parr, a woman who actually became Henry's last wife. So here we have two figures from the English Reformation. Henry who began it and his last wife Catherine Parr who was a dedicated Protestant woman who wanted further reform. The reformers never quite got the complete reformation that they'd wanted, which was why in the later 1500s Gainsborough became a centre of Puritanism. Puritans were people who literally wanted to purify the Church of England. They wanted to purify it from any trappings of Catholicism and to make it more Protestant. Eventually some of those became separatists. They wanted to separate entirely. But here in Gainsborough in the later 1500s there was a strong Puritan community. It included some of the Hickman family who bought the old hall in 1596 but also their commercial rivals the Ray and St Paul family. And it's the Rays particularly who become significant as the sponsor of men like John Smith who became important English Baptists. So who was this John Smith? He was a remarkable man from a remarkable village. This is Sturton Le Steeple in Nottinghamshire. Although rather confusingly, as you can see, the church has got a tower and not a steeple. It's actually one of the most remarkable villages in British Christian history. Uh, from this village came three very significant Christian leaders within a period of only a few years. Firstly, there was John Lascelles. John Lascelles was burnt at the stake in 1546 one of the most important of the late Protestant martyrs on, during Henry VIII's reign. A Protestant martyr burnt by a king who was supposedly a Protestant because of his advanced Protestant views. A really very significant figure. A few years later, in about 1570, John Smith was born here or somewhere in the vicinity, uh, for example, the little hamlet of Hablesford nearby. Uh, what do we know about Smith's early life? Well, we know that he went off to university, he went to Christ College, Cambridge, uh, where he came further under the influence of Puritans and became quite a radical Puritan in himself and a fellow of the college. When uh, he decided to get married though, he had to give up being a fellow uh, and became city lecturer in Lincoln. Sir William Ray, uh, one of the key influential local Puritan gentry, helped him to get that post. 
but within two years, Smith lost the job due to local politics and therefore became something of an itinerant preacher in the neighbourhood, though he may actually have helped run a grammar school here in Sturton. But there's a third person in this remarkable sequence of interesting Christian leaders from one tiny village, because only a few years after Smith, John Robinson was born here. That's the John Robinson who became a key figure linked to the Scrooby congregation, particularly when they were in um, in the Netherlands, and actually is known as the pastor of the pilgrims, the leader of the congregation that eventually went to America. How did one village produce three such remarkable people? Well, we'll possibly never know. But it's likely that Smith and Robinson both took their early lessons from the Reverend Quip, the minister in this church, whose own children went on to be significant Puritans as well. And perhaps they were headhunted as bright young Puritan men to be sent off to university in the pattern that the Ray family followed. And we know, for example, that when Smith was at university, he was later joined as his student servant by a young man called Richard Bernard, who came from Epworth, just a few miles up the road from here, and was certainly sponsored by the Ray family. Bit of a coincidence that those two ended up in the same rooms together. So what a remarkable history from this place. Two great church leaders, one a Baptist, one the leader of the Mayflower Pilgrims, and a Protestant martyr as well. After his problems in Lincoln, John Smith had something of a roving career, living in a couple of places in the district before he finally seemed to have settled and based himself in, in Gainsborough. He earned some money perhaps as a clerk or as a travelling doctor of some form, uh, but from 1604 he was certainly living here. We know that his child was christened, but also significantly he got into trouble in the parish church. He got into trouble for preaching illegally. The vicar, Jerome Phillips, who was a fellow Puritan, made the excuse that he'd been absent and therefore Smith had just filled in to take some of the prayers. But it was part of a pattern that developed in Smith's life where trouble was increasingly following him around, despite the fact that he had many friends in the town, including Sir William Ray. So eventually Smith began to form his own covenanted congregation, although his critics later said he was made minister by tradesmen, the tradesmen of Gainsborough who saw him as an important spiritual leader, including merchants like John Merton. Well, we've come right up against uh, the parish church here in, in Gainsborough. Uh, this church has been considerably rebuilt since John Smith's day, but this tower and doorway are the original. So it's quite amusing to think that John Smith, the future Baptist leader, would have carried his own child through this door for her christening in 1604. Of course, a few years before he radically changed his opinion about baptism and christening. We've come a few miles out of Gainsborough to the attractive Lincolnshire village of Glentworth. This was the home of the Ray family, the family that was so important and influential in Gainsborough life. And here is the magnificent tomb that was built for Sir Christopher Ray, showing him and his family. It's one of my favourite places in, in Lincolnshire. And here we have uh, Sir Christopher Ray in his red robes, he was a Yorkshireman who became Lord Chief Justice under Queen Elizabeth I. But actually what is makes them so important is that the family of Sir Christopher were the, the real spiritual powerhouse of this area of Lincolnshire, one of the most significant Puritan families across a wide area of the North Midlands. So we have his wife, Lady Anne, very committed Puritan woman of, uh, with some amazing connections into leading Puritans across the country. We have on the top uh, Sir William Ray, the only son of this couple, 
who became the patron of John Smith. John Smith described him as the principal patron of godly religion in the county. So even John Smith saw him as a very significant person. And then down here we have four daughters, two of whom died in infancy, and then we have the oldest daughter, Isabel, and Frances. Two very bright, very clever ladies who were equally committed to the Puritan cause. And they in particular uh, were famous for using their wealth to identify bright young men who could be sent to university to be the next generation of Puritan preachers. People like Richard Bernard, who became vicar of Worksop and was a close friend of John Smith, possibly even John Smith himself, we don't know but they had close connections to them. Well, I've now come and squatted myself down beside the statue of the older daughter, Isabel, and then just behind me, popping over my shoulder perhaps, is, is Francis. Now, not even the patronage of the wealthy and powerful Ray family could protect all the local Puritans when in the early 1600s, pressure started to tighten. Uh, and of course, John Smith uh, was already having trouble holding down a job, but in 1605, uh, the ISIS acted, particularly on the Nottinghamshire side of the river, to eject four of the leading Puritan troublemakers from their parish. And this, of course, brought together the crisis of what did the separatists do? And one of the interesting things that happened is that in 1606, they decided to hold a meeting to plan the future. And they met at the house of Isabel. At that point of time, she was Lady Bowes, a very wealthy woman, but seen as a very safe place for radical Puritans to meet. And it's probably at that meeting that John Smith led calls for the decision about separating from the Church of England finally, and therefore deciding to go across to the Netherlands, where they were more likely to be able to worship and live in peace. It would have been a moment of extreme stress and pressure. Lots of interesting people were at that meeting. Smith himself, Richard Clifton, perhaps John Robinson, Richard Bernard, Thomas Helwys, one of the few laymen there, and other important Puritans of the time, like John Dodd and Arthur Hildersham. But the actual words that were spoken there were long argued about who said what. But the end result was that John Smith decided to leave the Church of England. The stress of that was so great that he became ill. And so that we know that sort of late 1606, early 1607, he went to live with Thomas Helwys, where Helwys had moved to the town of Baseford near Nottingham, a place where Smith could recover and plan the move to uh, the Netherlands. These Ray family, they never went to the Netherlands, but they remained leading Puritans for the rest of their lives, really very influential and worth a video all of their own. So important, in fact, that years later, Thomas Helwys dedicated one of his books to Isabel because he thought she was the woman in England who would most understand his arguments about separation and purity of faith. Well, we've looked at the rays of Glentworth, but who was this Thomas Helwys who flits in and out of our story, who dedicated a book to Isabel Ray as late as 1611? Well, to find that out, we've got to go into Nottinghamshire. Well, we've now come to the Nottinghamshire village of Ascombe to find out who Thomas Helwys was. This village of Ascombe is really just a couple of miles away from Sturton le Steeple, where his friend John Smith uh, grew up. So they were lived really, really, really close to each other. Ascombe was the ancestral home of the Helwys family, if that's how you pronounced it or how they pronounced it. Uh, it could have been Elwis, it could even have been 
airless. We don't really know how they would have said it at the time. But they lived here for centuries, uh, and then Thomas's father, he took out a lease at a place called Broxtow Hall on the edge of Nottingham. Uh, and he worked there as in, in land and industry and in law. Thomas himself trained in London in the law and went to live at Broxtow Hall himself, where he eventually married uh, Joan, who was his housekeeper for a time. While he was at Broxtow, he also would have been involved with uh, Isabel Ray, as, as she then was one of the Folgem family. She'd married one of the Folgems and they had business interests which connected with Thomas. So he was a well-known person in that part of Nottinghamshire. Perhaps through those business connections, he got interested in radical Puritan religion. When John Smith had his breakdown in about 1606, after the crisis of separatism, he actually went to live with Thomas Helwys. Probably by that stage, Helwys had left uh, Broxtow and moved just a couple of miles to Baseford, where he lived for a little while before leaving the country and actually going to Amsterdam. Beautiful village, uh, lovely church, and then behind me, is a row of cottages which were actually originally almshouses paid for by members of the Helwys family. This is where our story comes back to the riverside at Gainsborough in May 1608 and the events that happened then are commemorated in this lovely little statue. In May 1608 John Smith's followers from the Gainsborough congregation and some of the Scrooby congregation led by Clifton, Brewster and later Robinson gathered together and the women and children got into the boat here. They sailed off down the river. They planned to meet their men on the Lincolnshire coast at Stallingborough. Uh, things went slightly wrong. The men made the crossing. The women had to follow later. But what happened in the Netherlands was of even greater importance. The Scrooby congregation moved to Leiden and became the Mayflower Pilgrims eventually. But John Smith's group stayed in Amsterdam. They rented a house from a Mennonite uh, and perhaps under his influence Smith became interested in Baptist ideas and made the seismic decision to baptise himself, followed by Thomas Helwys and other members of their group. This was a huge revolutionary act for a man who was an English Puritan, and it had a significant impact on the history of the Christian people in Britain as a whole. Of course, there were two congregations who went to the Netherlands. One became the Baptists and the other became the Congregationalists based at Leiden. Uh, and eventually, of course, some of that congregation went to America on the Mayflower in 1620. So there's always been a claim for a connection between this town and the Mayflower pilgrims. Well, here we are at the, one of the churches in the town, the Re Reformed Congregational Church. And as you can see, there's a plaque here which talks about the American ambassador having laid this stone as part of the church's rebuilding. In the 1890s, Gainsborough woke up to its American connections and able to raise funds from Americans because of this connection. But actually, we don't really know that Robinson and the Scrooby congregation ever really had any connection to the town of Gainsborough other than to leave from here. I'm now at Sornby, which is a tiny little Nottinghamshire village, actually just a couple of miles from Gainsborough on the other side of the River Trent. And it's one of my favourite places to bring visitors and to bring American tourists who particularly love some of the old world charm here. To visit the church, you've got to park in a farmyard and then you walk through this lovely old gateway. And we walk through into this wonderful little churchyard here. Uh, it's really one of my favourite places with a magnificent church tower above us. But what is really important here is that this is a church connected to the Helwys family. Both 
Thomas Elwes and his cousin Sir Gervais. Well, I've now come into uh, St Martin's Church at Sornby, a, a church closely associated with the Helwes family, and now in the care of the Church's Conservation Trust. Uh, this has not been a regular parish church for many years, but there's a particular connection to the Helwes family which I'm very keen to have a look at. So this is the tomb of John Helwes. John Helwes was the uncle of Thomas Helwes uh, and the father of Gervais Helwes. Gervais Helwes was Lord of the Manor of Sornby and cousin of Thomas. And of course it's because of uh, Gervais that Thomas was able to hire a boat uh, and actually hired the boat under the name of Gervais that they escaped from Gainsborough on. Uh, Gervais was a powerful figure in local church affairs as well, though perhaps not anything like as much of a Puritan. Uh, we know that he presented Richard Clifton's successor at Babworth, for example, and also he brought Jerome Phillips, the Puritan vicar of Gainsborough, to be vicar here at Sornby. It was actually quite a desirable, well-paid living for a clergyman in those times. Um, but Sir Gervais ran into a few problems. So he's most famous for how he died. Uh, he made an error. He, he actually took on the job of being Lieutenant of the Tower of London. One of the prisoners was poisoned and Sir Gervais was never able to prove that he knew nothing about it. So in 1615, which turned out to be a bad year for the Helwesses, Sir Gervais was hung on Tower Hill in London and his connection therefore with this church came to a very sudden end. But what about Thomas? We need to think about what happened to Thomas later in his life. I've moved to the most comfortable seat in Sornby Church, sitting in front of these old bells that are kept here, which are quite interesting if you're keen on engineering and that sort of thing. But we need to think about what happened to Thomas Helwes later in his life. Of course, we know that he went to the Netherlands with John Smith, and that he was the person that John Smith baptised first after he'd baptised himself. But actually, fairly soon after that, Helwes and Smith fell out. And Helwes decided that he would leave the Netherlands and come back to England with a small group of people of his own, including John Smith and Thomas Seymour, both Gainsborough people. So they came back to England and set up a Baptist congregation in Spitalfields, but very rapidly got into trouble with the king. And so we know that Thomas Helwes disappeared into prison in about 1615, and that was the last that was heard of him. But it wasn't the end of the Baptists. John Merton survived, and Baptists actually established themselves in Lincolnshire very soon after that. We think Thomas Seymour came back to Gainsborough. By about 1618, there were Baptists in the area, and indeed, by the early 1620s, there was a well-established Baptist church in the county town of Lincoln nearby. But what these people also did was bring back with them from the Netherlands a commitment to the values of religious liberty. Uh, Smith started this, uh, then Helwes followed on, and John Merton wrote about it as well. And so it's worth just spending a little bit of time seeing how their ideas developed. So in about 1611, John Smith started arguing that the magistrate, the civil law and the criminal law body, should not be involved in religious matters. He wrote, the magistrate is not by virtue of his office to meddle with religion or matters of conscience, to force or compel men to this or that form of religion or doctrine. Soon after that, Thomas Helwes developed this idea further. In fact, he wrote his words down and sent them to King James, which turned out not to be a great idea. And Helwes was the first Englishman to argue that any religion should be free of government persecution. And he said, for our Lord the King is but an earthly king, and he has no authority as a king but in earthly causes. For men's religion to God is between God and themselves. Let them be heretics, Turks or Muslims, 
Jews or whatsoever, it appertains not to the earthly power to punish them in the least measure. Radical opinions for the time. And soon after that, John Merton, who was held in prison as well, wrote these words to the king. It is not in your power to compel the heart. You may compel men to be hypocrites, as a great many are, who are false-hearted towards God and the state, which is sin both in you and them. In other words, it's pointless passing laws on religion. You just force people to say things that they don't really believe. Now, John Merton was one of the Smith congregation from Gainsborough. He survived his time in prison, but most importantly, his words survived as well. They were copied down and used by the famous American uh, leader, Roger Williams, in his book, The Bloody Tenet. And from there, they passed into wider circulation. We can see the echo of those words in the first American uh, amendment of the American Constitution and actually in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, Article 18. So freedom of religion, a fundamental gift to the rest of Britain from these first Baptists. So against all the odds, by the 1620s, the English Baptists had actually become established in England. We know there were at least four congregations by that date, and other Baptists scattered around the district. But there's another interesting little curio that comes to mind because of one of the names on the gravestones here at Sturton. One of the graves is named after a Mr Spittlehouse. And in fact, there's another interesting Gainsborough Baptist called John Spittlehouse, a man who was born in the town, probably educated in Gainsborough, and quite likely was taught at school by a man called Hansard Knollys, who later on became a famous Baptist in his own right. But this John Spittlehouse uh, was a radical, a soldier. He fell in and out with Oliver Cromwell and was in and out of prison, uh, but a committed Baptist nonetheless. Two things about him are of interest. One of which is he took the Baptist view of religious liberty very seriously and was the first Englishman to suggest that even a book like the Quran should be legal to print and circulate in this country. But his other interest is that he published also uh, on the history of the Baptists. And his argument was that actually the Baptists began long before Smith and Helwes, many, many years back in the mists of antiquity. He was a believer in the idea of Baptist perpetuity. So some very interesting people in Baptist history came from this area of Lincolnshire and Nottinghamshire. Well, we've returned to the start of our story, and it's a chance just to reflect on the her heritage and legacy of John Smith and the Gainsborough congregation. We, of course, have got millions of English-speaking Baptists worldwide who have some connection with them. But also, we have freedom of religion in Britain and many other countries. So here in Gainsborough, we have the parish church, back in their day, the only church in the town, now right next to the United Reformed Church, literally a stone's throw from one to the other. Round the corner from there, there's a Quaker meeting house. There's a Catholic church. There's a Methodist church. Indeed, John Wesley himself, preached in the old hall in the town. So now we have freedom to go to whatever type of church you want to. It's not dictated by law anymore. To find out more about these stories, you can read some of the books that we have published. Restless Souls Pilgrim's Roots provides the epic story of how the Christian faith developed in this area and sets the Baptists of this story in the context of a long local tradition of religious radicalism. From Here We Change the World provides a handy guide on what sites of Christian interest you can visit and see in Nottinghamshire and Lincolnshire. This includes the sites in this video 
but also much else, including Wesley's Epworth, which is barely 10 miles away from Gainsborough. You can get these books from the usual suppliers, from Gainsborough Heritage Centre or from the website of Bookworm Retford. At Pilgrims and Prophets, we also offer a range of tailor-made Christian history tours in Lincolnshire and Nottinghamshire. For Baptist history, we provide options ranging from half a day to a full two-day tour. You will find details about this on our website. You can also keep in touch by following us on Facebook or Twitter. And don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube.